17. Let me get to my assignment for tonight. I, I really felt this weekend wasn't as much uh, wasn't as much about a where the house is going as much as it is a strengthening about where the house is. Uh, and a reiterating, if you may, and a coming alongside uh, and, and, and letting, first of all, everybody know that no matter who calls you crazy, you ain't. You, you might be a little peculiar, but you ain't crazy. All right, You might, might be a little different, but not crazy. And so we're going to uh, encourage you with this. Mark 17, and I'm going to start in verse 20, but before that, let me read Mark 15, 34. Mark 15, 34 is going to be really... Uh, my main text, but I'm reading John 17 for a reason. And Mark 15, 34 says, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabachthani, or my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, John 17, starting in verse number 20, this, of course, is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, of course, what we've called the Lord's Prayer, the Lord would have never prayed because he never needed to pray, forgive me for my trespasses, because he never had any trespasses. Huh? I mean, you know, the bread didn't need to pray for bread. He could, he could cause it to appear anytime he wanted. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is the disciples' prayer. This is really all of John 20 is the Lord's Prayer. And from verse 1 all the way up to 20, Jesus is praying for the 12 but then when he gets to verse 20, he now begins to pray also for us because he says this, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. How many know that's now us? Yeah. That they all may be one. Everybody say one. one. That they may be one. They may be in union. They might be united, not single. Uh, see, for, for, for a lot of years... Every time I heard John 17 quoted, and when I would read it, for some reason I never paid attention to, to the proper context of it, because every time I ever heard it preached, I used to literally say this. It wasn't, it wasn't 10 years ago that I'd get up and say, well, there was one prayer of Jesus's that never got answered. Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, may they be one as we are one, and we got between 30 to 40,000 denominations all over the world, and none of us can get along with each other. We're all fighting and bickering, and arguing about all kinds of doctrine, and, and, and until... Until the church gets together and we're finally one in our belief, that's when, you know, and that ain't never going to happen. Hallelujah. I'm just going to tell you right now, that was never the purpose of this passage. It was never about let's try to get all these people thinking and believing the same way. He tells us then four times in John 17 what it means to be one. Now, now, now read on with me. Uh, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So he, he's explaining, he said, what I want them to understand is their union with the Godhead. I want them to know that, that, that it, it doesn't matter, uh, neither height nor death, breath, with nothing can separate them from the love of God, that they, they never have to beg for me to show up because I'm always where they are. Yeah. All right, they, they, they never have to chase me down because it's orphans that have to chase their fathers around. And we're not orphans, we're son. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. We're not coming to a, 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 we're not coming to a judgment seat. We're coming to a mercy seat. We're not walking into a courtroom. We're walking into the living room and daddy's sitting on a lazy boy saying, climb up in my lap. Okay, it, it's a total different mindset that goes along with it. They, they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory that you gave to me, I have now given to them that they may be one just as we are one. And he tells us again, <clears throat> I and them and you and me that they may be me, they may be made perfect or mature in union, in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also who you have give, gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So now, uh, I, I read John 17 for a reason, but let me, let me, let me, uh, let me just... I got to build up to it, which is normal anyway. Uh, I want to let you know kind of my thought process and where this comes from. <clears throat> I, I have, from the time I was, from the time I was very young, growing up in church, there was always in the back of my mind, 
Uh, you know, I, I remember my dad preaching a sermon when I was probably six or seven years old out of Hebrews where the writer of Hebrews is quoting uh, God in the Old Testament who said that he'd never leave us and he'd never forsake us. And, and I remember thinking, man, you know, that's amazing. God said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. But then as I began to get older and, and then I heard my dad preach a sermon on, on, on what I read to you out of Mark 15 where Jesus the firstborn, our elder brother is hanging on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the way my dad taught it is the way that it was has been traditionally taught for, especially uh, since uh, Augustine and especially after John Calvin with penal substitution atonement. And it was a mindset of this, that it was at that moment that God, who is holy and righteous, it was, notice Jesus, it was the only to first time he ever called the Father God because at that moment he was no longer Father. And I literally preached just four or five years ago that it was on the cross that he then took all of our sin and Jesus became a bastard. He became an orphan. He took all of our orphanness on himself so that now we can become then the sons of God, that, that, that God turned away from him. I mean, you know, there's hymns that say God turned away. There's newer songs that say heaven turned away. Uh, you know, Carmen told us in the 90s that God looked away. Yeah. Amen, you know, some of you younger ones, just go look up Carmen on YouTube or something, and you'll figure that out. <clears throat> it's, it's, all, all of the mindset of that was that, that, that God had to then turn from him. And so there was always, I mean, I preached it because that's all I'd ever heard. And, you know, it kind of made sense. I mean, if Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, then obviously, you know, he at least felt forsaken in some form or another. And, 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 and God, who cannot look on sin because we heard that most of our lives growing up. And, and then at least, at least for me, you know, I got saved a minimum of 50 times because of Matthew chapter 7. And it amazes me the people that still want to preach Matthew chapter 7, that Matthew 7 has nothing to do with any believer on this side of the cross. When, when, when Jesus, speaking about false prophets, he stands up and he says, many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and healed the sick and raised the dead and cast out devils? And I'll say away from me, I never knew you. And man, I'd run to the altar because, you know, as a kid, I'm thinking, you know, that means I can do all these miracles and do all this cool stuff. And at the end of my life, I could end up like Moses. And because I struck the rock rather than spoke to it, I don't pass go. I don't collect $200 straight to hell. Yep. And so at the end of my life, I can serve him faithfully for years. But at the end of my life, he's going to kick me to the curb for doing one thing wrong. I mean, I mean, I mean that's why I believe, you know, I became then the preacher's kid they told you to stay away from. Hallelujah. <laughs> For at least five years, I'm like, I might as well go get stoned, man. I mean, I wasn't even living in Colorado, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, you know what? If 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 this is what all this is about, I mean, if if I have no confidence uh, that he's going to be able to keep me, I mean, why should I even try? Because I know I'm going to screw it up, man. I, I'm I'm not going to be able to do this the way that I need to do this. And so, I also I also realize this. Um, Whatever is true in a family of the firstborn, all of the other kids watch how the parents respond to and treat the firstborn so they get an idea of not only how they'll be treated, but then what they can get away with. Now, how many of you know that first-time parents are crazy? I mean, they are. I mean, the first time someone has a baby, you go to grab the baby, and, and they're like, did you, did, did you wash your hands? Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> you know did, did, here's some sanitizer. You know, we got to sanitize you before you can pick up our baby. I'm, I'm, I mean, if the, if, the, if the binky falls on the floor, they're grabbing it, they're sanitizing it, they're boiling it in oil, they're putting it in the microwave. But by the time you get to the second or third baby, they're like, can I hold the baby? Here you go. They're, they're throwing the child. I mean, the binky, it's five-second rule, if not ten-second rule. They're just picking it up, wiping it, popping it right in the mouth. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they're, just, they're just realizing, you know what, man, it ain't that big of a deal. But that first one, because you see, in the natural, we as human parents, we're growing. 
We're maturing. We're, we're trying to figure stuff out. We've not done this before. We don't, we don't know what it means to be a parent. We watched other people do it, but there's still nothing like doing it yourself. Because, you know, it's always the people that don't have kids that say, well, if that was my child, I'd like, just wait till you get some. Just, just, just wait. I know we, we love to say all that stuff until we got a crazy kid. <laughs> and we're trying to figure out what to do with them. <laughs> That's right. But, but we know that with God, the Father, he, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So with God, there's no shadow of turning with him. God's not growing up. He's not maturing. He's always been mature. It's what he's always been perfect. And so he, he's, not, he's not growing with us. He's always been. Now, our ideas of him are constantly growing and changing, but God, God doesn't change. He never has he doesn't, he's the same. And, and so to, to, under, to begin to comprehend that, it's like if, if God never changes, if Jesus is our firstborn, and I watch how he treated the firstborn, and now I am a millionth or two millionth or three or 20 or a hundred millionth son born, then years later, if he forsook our big brother, how can I have confidence? that he won't throw me away. I mean, if he forsook Jesus. So all my life, there was always in the back of my brain, in my, in my subconscious, this thing that was like, I know he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. Matter of fact, let me, let, let me even read to you what it means because I, I love it from the original language. It's the Greek word apostasia. So we get the word apostasy from. And it's literally forsaken means that, uh, that he won't leave us, he won't depart from us, he won't defect from us. Webster's Dictionary says to quit, desert, abandon, or withdraw from. In other words, God will never leave you, depart from you, defect from you, abandon you, quit on you, or withdraw from you, period. He said, I'm, I'm never going to do any of those things. When I make up my mind towards you, you cannot change it away from you. Your behavior doesn't remove it away. You can't keep me as your daddy from being your daddy. I'm crazy about you, and I'm never going to run from you. I'm going to run towards you. But you see, at the same time, if Jesus, if Jesus was really forsaken, if it is the way it's plainly written because that's the argument with most people. Well, the Bible clearly says, you know, the, the, the Bible, and I've, I've had people want to argue scripture with me and they'll say, well, it plainly says here. I'm like, there's just not a whole lot that just plainly says, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you, 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 need, to, you need to study. That's just, it's more than just plainly there. But if... If he was forsaken by the Father, uh, how, do, how do I know if he won't throw me away someday? I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good question to ask. And I, I read John 17 for a reason because Jesus is letting us as his disciples and, and sons of the future know that what I'm praying above everything, everything, He's like, the one thing I want you to get down pat is that I and the Father are one and I and the Father are in you and you are in us. We are in perfect union together. There is no separation. If, if there might be an illusion of it to you, but it's not in the Father's mind towards us. We, we were alienated, Colossians says, in our minds. So the illusion is between our ears, thinking that God was away from us when he never was when his heart was, I want you to understand that we are joined. And what God is joined, no man, listen, man, you can't unjoin it. Whew, I don't know about you, that's good news to me right there. It's like, thank you, Jesus. And now this is, uh, this is some of the things that, uh, that I've been meditating on with, uh, with this passage. I, I, don't know, I don't know what was going on in Jesus. I have no doubt that the Son of Man, Jesus, his humanity, we know he was forsaken by men because only, only the three Marys are there at the foot of the cross. I mean, recorded. I mean, his mama, his auntie, 
and Mary Magdalene. You know, I mean, those are people, but you know, mama comes to everything. Yeah. Amen. You know, she's going to come to your crucifixion, your incarceration. Everybody got an Auntie Mary that comes to everything also. You know, she got, you could be doing something stupid and Auntie Mary shows up. Everybody's got one of those aunties. Uh, Mary, she ain't leaving Jesus' side because of everything he did for her. She's committed. And then the only other one there is John, the beloved, the one who Jesus loves. And some argue that that also could have been Lazarus and not John. And maybe, you know, I don't know. Uh, I just know that uh, John's the one that wrote it down. And for some reason, he didn't put the name of the person. So he was probably talking about himself. But anyway, it was someone Jesus loved. But... But all of his disciples had forsaken him. Where, where, where was all these followers? All the people that were just screaming a few days before, Hosanna in the highest. Where were all of they? There's no doubt in his humanity. He felt alone. He felt forsaken. But the idea, because how this has traditionally been taught, is that the father turned his face. Because God could not look on Jesus anymore because God cannot look on sin. How many of you have ever heard that before? God can't look on sin. We've, man, we've all heard it. The, the problem is, is when you try to find scriptures for it. Uh, it, it it's actually, the, there's only one verse in the Bible that even comes close to saying it. And it's Habakkuk 1.13. And Habakkuk 1.13 says, God, you are so holy and you are so righteous how can you look on evil? How can you look on evil? But then, like most, most people don't finish the verse, the rest of the story. And then there's a comma, and then it says in one translation, so why do you? Yeah. Listen, the idea, the, <laughs> the idea that God cannot look on sin is one of the most ludicrous beliefs yeah. we can ever have. Because if God can't look on sin, he's either blind... He's choosing to be blindfolded because we've almost treated sin like it is kryptonite to God. That, that whenever for some reason sin gets near God's presence, God gets weak in the presence of sin. But yet Paul said where sin abounds, grace superabounds. So, so God doesn't get weak in the midst of sin. He gets stronger in the midst of sin. And not only is he looking at sin, it don't freak him out. The way God hates sin. Does he hate sin? Yes. Because it leads to death in his kids. He doesn't hate sin because of what it does to him. He hates sin because of what it does to us. Matter of fact, we, we've almost got these ideas, you know, all the way back from the beginning that Adam and Eve sinned and God came down to walk in the garden and God had to say to Adam and Eve, where are you? I, I've literally heard, I remember hearing a preacher preach. It's because God can't look on sin. He didn't know where they were. I mean, listen, just think about this. The almighty, omniscient, omnipotent God couldn't find them. He's just like, hey, man, I don't know what happened. <laughs> you see sometimes how ludicrous it is? Uh, we just have to have somebody sometimes just bring it out. And then we go, how did I ever think that? But But then... Him saying, where are you, was not that he didn't know where he was located. What he was saying is, I gave you dominion and authority over the earth, and I gave you an identity as a son. Where are you? You've left your seat of authority. Where are you? All right, you're, you're not where you're supposed to be, son. I, I placed you here, but now you're over here. And we've had this idea that it was almost like when Adam sinned, God came down to walk with him, but God, who can't look at sin, couldn't look at him anymore, couldn't see him anymore. And for some reason, we read past scriptures that said God came down, killed an animal, got close enough to their sin that he wrapped them in some leather clothes. Come on. Yeah. Come on. 
He wrapped him in some lamb skin, man. I mean, he, 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 he made him clothes. The same thing happened with Cain. That Cain who kills his brother, rather than God turning away from Cain, God gets close enough to Cain to put his finger on his forehead and make a mark. He had to look directly at sin, and it did not only repulse him, but, but in the midst of that, in, by grace, he protects Cain so nobody kills him. Yeah. Yeah. The same thing with, same thing with Noah. You know, people say, oh yeah, but God wiped all the people out. He gave them more than 100 years to build boats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he sent Noah in every day to preach to them that a flood was coming. Yeah. <laughs> and he gave them more than 100 years of grace. Yeah. It was not God repulsed by them. It was never God towards us. Because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But how we really preached it is God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. That the issue was God. God was angry at us and he was irritated. We were bad kids and he was really angry. And so he, he had to appease himself by beating our big brother. And once he beat our big brother and our big brother took the punch, he now consumed all of God's anger at us. Now daddy's good with us. I mean, he was in a bad mood a few minutes ago, but now, now he feels better. Because he beat the hell out of our big brother. So now, hey, life is good. The problem with that is this. It's why the way we presented the gospel, most Americans and people around the world that hear it presented that way, they got that Doobie Brothers mentality. Jesus is just all right with me. Everybody loves the big brother. Everybody loves the fact that he took the beating for us. But then our big brother said, the reason I did this was so I could reconcile you so you can have a relationship with the father. And everybody's like, no, nah, we're good with him. Jesus, Daddy, uh-uh. But we don't want anything to do with a God and a father uh, that would beat his own son because he was ticked off. Not only that, but then our eschatology is we taught him that Jesus has consumed all of God's wrath on the cross. He's not mad anymore, but he's holding some deep down in his heart, but he's because he's going to come back someday and he's going to slaughter billions on the planet. So, you know, he's still a little irritated. He's just, he's on Xanax right now. You know, I'm, I mean, he... He's on some Vicodin. He just, he, woo. I mean, he's feeling good right now. He, you know, I mean, he, he drank some Jesus blood and it made him feel a little bit better. But, but, you know, there's coming a day. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay. And so it, it's still, it perverts the whole idea. And, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't till, to be honest, what began to shift my thinking was, I think it was 10, 12 years ago. And, and Bill Maher, Bill Maher put out, uh, you know, the, the documentary Religious. And, uh, I mean, every Christian should watch it because it shows what the world thinks about us. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously I don't agree with it. Bill's, you know, he's crazy. But I'm telling you, Bill is a seeker after truth. Bill, Bill calls himself an atheist. I don't believe he's anti-God. I believe he's anti-religion. He was raised in religion, raised around it. He, he, he can't stand it. But, but man, it, I've, I've, I've sat and listened to him actually talk about the person of Jesus. And he don't have an issue with Jesus. I, I mean, he's like, man, if people would actually live like this Jesus, it, it, it would change the world. But, but when it comes to the idea of how the gospel's been presented, I heard him say that. He said, so, so this father of his was really mad. And so he beat his son to death uh, bruised him, beat him, bloodied him, but now he's okay. It's almost like, and I heard Bill Maher say this, it's like Jesus saved the father. He changed his mind. He, 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 he was really mad and wrathful, but then all of a sudden Jesus, Jesus consumed it and took it. Now, do, do I still believe that, that Jesus consumed it? Yeah, it's just the father and him were never separate. 
Because God was in Christ reconciling the world. The Father wasn't over here, not looking away. The Father, the Son, the Spirit were represented. The Godhead was smack dab hanging on the cross. And what was going on on the cross was not a separation between the Father and the Son because his prayer was that they may know that we are one, we are in union, and we are always in one. And it was the Godhead showing humanity, I love you so much. It's not my anger and wrath at you. It's my anger and wrath at sin, death, and the devil. And I now am going to consume all of your anger towards me, your misunderstanding, your violence, and then I'm going to go into hell, defeat it once and for all, rise triumphant, so death has no more authority over you, and sin has no authority over you. That's what the gospel's about. That the cross was the greatest act of love that the world has ever seen. It wasn't an angry father beating his kid but it was an amazing act of love. So if that's true and Jesus really wasn't forsaken by the Father, then what exactly was going on? And, and some of you have heard little bits and pieces of this, but tonight I wanted, to, I wanted to walk you through Psalm 22. See, Jesus, uh, four of the seven things Jesus said on the cross, were they, they were prophetic messianic messages. Uh, Jesus said nothing by accident. Uh, I mean, Jesus, I uh, just preached this uh, last Sunday at, at, at home that, that God is life. I've been in a little series at home that uh, there's three main nouns that describe God. God is, God is light, God is life, and God is love. Everything else are adjectives, you know. Uh, God is holy, adjective. It, it describes his character, but it's not who he is. God is righteous. Yeah, he is, but that describes, it's not who he is. It's just, it, it describes his character. It's an adjective, not a person, place, or a thing. It's, it's not a noun. Because anytime, anytime you say, you know, that God, God is light, God is life, God is love, normally people will say, oh, yeah, but he's also holy. You know, especially people just consumed with mixture. You know, I mean, that, that's the word I get all the time. Oh, but he's also holy and he's righteous and he's just. And I'm like, yes, he's all those things. That is true. But those are descriptions of his character. It, it doesn't describe who he is. It describes a part of him. Hmm? And First John tells us, uh, man, he, he's light, he's life, he's love. But I, I share with everybody this, this, this last week about the idea of God being life. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and I am the life. And he comes to Lazarus' tomb, or he, he comes to the tomb of Eleazar, uh, which was the actual rendering that, that, that they had heard. He comes to the tomb. Lazarus or Eleazar means one who had been ruled by God. Uh, I believe it's an amazing picture of everyone up to that time born in Adam. Adam who had been ruled by God. He'd been dead uh, behind this rock. Uh, for four days, going on the fifth day. Come on, how I many know the, the whole Adamic race at that time had been dead in their trespasses and sin? But then Jesus shows up and says, "Roll away the stone." I came to get that stone out of the way, that rock. Yeah. All right, that 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 was against you. I'm here to remove it and call people out of the grave. But then he prays out loud and he says this. He said, "Father, I'm not asking you this for me, but so they." may believe. So Jesus would always say stuff, not just because the father needed to hear him, because he and the father were one. There was no separation. Daddy was right there with them. There was a union that was there. They were, they were still individuals, but they were perfect in unity. And so in, in the midst of that, he would say stuff, Daddy, I'm not saying this for you and I. I'm saying this for them. And so Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he said a bunch of different stuff. But in this passage, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, to, to a Jew, every, every Jew memorized the Psalms because the Psalms were their songbook. All right? It was, uh, th there, wasn't, there wasn't chapters and verses. Uh, they would just say or sing the first line of the psalm, 
And then everybody else would sing the rest of it. So if you wanted to sing the 23rd Psalm, you didn't say turn to Psalm 23. You were in the midst of the synagogue and you would start singing, the Lord is my shepherd. And everybody else would start singing the rest of the Psalm. It was something they had memorized from the time they were little kids. And Jesus on the cross is actually singing. In the midst, in the midst of experiencing hell, forsakenness by humans, because God won't forsake you, but I'm telling you right now, people will forsake you. Family will forsake you. People that you thought would be with you your whole life, all of a sudden that crazy, and they run off from you. All right, you cannot get away from being forsaken in this life, but God won't forsake you. God won't leave you alone. God won't throw you away. You might feel like it because of what you're going through, but in the midst of feeling like hell, I mean, how do you sing like heaven when you're experiencing hell? I mean, Jesus hanging on the cross, the most horrible torture known to humanity, in the midst of all the pain, he begins to sing. Now, to every Jew standing there, not only... Not only did they hear him say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But to every Jew, they would have begun to sing, at least in their mind, the rest of the song. Matter of fact, we do it all the time without even realizing it. Because that's why David would get a revelation and he'd send it to Asaph and he'd say, put this revelation in song. Because they'll forget the sermon, they'll forget the prophecy, but they'll never forget the song. You know, I got a simple example for you. All right, are you ready? Don't stop. Thank you. I'm telling you, once you hear a song, it might be a song you've not heard for 30 years, and it'll come on the radio, or you'll be walking through the mall, and it'll pop up, and you'll, hey, I mean, you'll start singing it. I'll give you something else simple. My baloney has a first name. It's... I'm telling you, once you hear a song, Man, it gets in you. That, that, that's why, that's why I've, I've always said, my, like my wife and daughter, I mean, they hear a song, they don't forget it. I mean, they, I mean, just Brittany was like that. She's a year and a half for walking through the mall, and she's singing to the song on the radio. We're like, where in the world did she hear that? I mean, just she hears it, doesn't forget it. And I'm like, if you sang the Bible to them, they'd memorize the whole Bible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just something about singing those songs. And, and so on the cross... Jesus, in the midst of all of his pains and feelings of forsakenness, begins to worship. He begins to sing, and he starts with a messianic psalm. And I'm, I'm going to walk you through it real quick. We're going to start in Psalm 22, verse 1, and we're going to run through it, and then we're going to wind it down and go get some deep. Hallelujah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. That's where we get the idea of God inhabits the praises of his people. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now understand something. You're a Jew. You're singing it either out loud or in your mind because Jesus started the chorus, okay? He started the song and every Pharisee, every Sadducee, every Jew is standing there and they're singing. And by the time they get to this part, all of a sudden it's dawning on them that we just said this to him hanging on the cross. We just said, if you are the son of God, why don't you come down off that cross? They, they were ridiculing him. Go ahead. But you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while I'm a mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Now watch this. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. I thirst. You brought me to the dust of death, Sheol. 
For dogs, Gentiles, Romans have surrounded me. The congregation, if you take that all the way back in the Septuagint, the Greek, it's ecclesia of the wicked. The synagogue of Satan has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. I can count on my bones. They look and stare at me. Now now watch this. I'm telling you, if you were a Jew standing there, by the time Jesus said, you pierce my hands and you pierce my feet, by the time they got to that part of the song, they were all standing there going, OMG. All right, we are crucifying our Messiah. This is happening right in front of us. What? They're freaking out about this moment because it's happened in front of them. Go ahead. Now look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they're casting lots. Here, imagine the Pharisees, and they're now watching the Roman soldiers dividing his garments in the midst of it, and in their mind they're still singing the song, and now they're freaking out because they're thinking, what did we do? That is why Paul said in Corinthians that the principalities and powers that crucified the Lord of glory, if they would have known, they wouldn't have done it. That wasn't talking about no demons, folks. The principalities and powers weren't demons. Demons knew who Jesus was just like angels did. That's talking. It's talking about Caiaphas. It, 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 come on. It, it's talking about Pilate, and it's talking about Herod. Those principalities and powers that were ruling wickedness in high places, if they would have known who he was, they wouldn't have done it. it freaked out the the Jews at that moment. Go ahead. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. My strength hasten to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brother and in the midst of the assembly, the ecclesia, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. Now watch this, very important. For he has not despise nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Look at that psalm is telling us right there. God did not turn his face from Jesus. He was not abhorred at the affliction of the afflicted one, and he did not turn his face. He, he, if he didn't turn his face from Jesus, he won't turn his face from you. We can have confidence as sons and daughters of God that when he's made up his mind already in Christ to be something for you and to you, you can't change his mind about it. Go ahead to the next one. My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I'll pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations, woo, that's a pretty interesting verse right there, shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. All those who go down to Sheol, down to the dust, shall bow before him. Even he who cannot keep himself alive... Posterity shall serve him. It will be recounted of the Lord to the next generation. Here we go. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has done this or it is finished. On the cross, experiencing forsakenness from men, Jesus begins to sing. Now, now I'm... For the next few minutes, uh, can can I be like Paul and say, uh, can I say this by permission? All right, will you just let my, all right, my creative mind run a little wild? I'm not trying to establish doctrine in this part right here. Just, just maybe, just maybe. I've learned the older I got to qualify things so that people don't blame you of something later that you didn't do or say or mean. But, but just maybe. As Jesus began to sing this on the cross and he gave up his last breath and said, it is finished, that at that moment he then began to descend into the lower parts of the earth. He experiences death. He experiences hell. And according according to Ephesians, according to Peter, he not only goes into the lower parts of the earth, but it says that he preached and declared then to the spirits that were there. In other words, Uh, maybe he kept singing the song. And just like David, David sang the song 
a thousand to two thousand years before, but David never finished the song. But the song and its singer finished David in hell. Maybe that is where David got the idea when he said, where can I go from your presence, O Lord? If I make my bed in heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are even there. Because the moment Jesus descended at that moment, he not only just defeated death, hell, and the grave, he got the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the inside out. He didn't come kick the door open from the outside in. He walked in legally as a human who now died and he walked in took the keys and kicked open the gates once and for all and so now nobody goes in or out without his permission huh he 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 went down and preached to the captives he made declaration to them maybe he sang them this psalm and he let them know that you feel forsaken here you feel left alone you feel like god is not here but i'm telling you now he's above all through all and in all and he has filled all things and he's now even here where you thought there was a place he couldn't be once and for all defeats death so that we can have eternal life. But just just walk with me a minute. Just uh, 20, 30 years in the future, uh, we see Paul and a young protege by the name of Silas or Sylvanus, and they're in a hell on earth. They're, They're in prison, and they're behind locked doors, and they're in chains, and they're laying in their own feces, and they're laying in their own urine. And in the midst of all of that, I can almost, I can almost see Silas looking over at Paul and, and he's saying, hey man, uh, you know, I thought hanging out with the apostle, everybody would be like bringing us water and, and carrying our stuff. And, you know, I, I thought people would be serving us. And, and, you know, instead we're in jail. I don't think I like this very much. I didn't know. I didn't get into this to get thrown into jail. I can almost see Paul looking at him and saying, so Silas, do you feel a little bit forsaken? Yeah, I feel forsaken. Man, I feel like nobody's here. I mean, I'm glad you're here with me, Paul, but nobody else around. We got nobody on our side. Where is God in the midst of this? And maybe that's when Paul looked at him and he said, well, you know what? Jesus on the cross probably felt the exact same way we did in his humanity. But he also knew that he was one with the Father. And you and I know that we are one with the Father and one with the Son. And he He's a very present help in time of trouble. He's always here because where he is, where we are, where we are, he is. That where I am, there you may be also. And he's ever present on the inside of us. So maybe, just maybe they begin to sing Psalm 22. And maybe Paul looked at him and said, you know what, Si? When Jesus felt this way, he began to sing this psalm. So let's begin to sing the psalm. And as they begin to sing, the Bible doesn't say what they sang. We don't know. It just says that they begin to sing and give praises to God. All of a sudden, the prison doors begin to shake the foundation, the doors flew open, the chains fell off. Not only did the chains fall off of Paul and Silas, it fell off everybody that was in that hell with them. (laughs) And in the midst of that, while they're experiencing hell, if you may, on earth, God in his infinite mercy shows up in the midst of that And they lead captivity captive. They lead a train out of that place. In the midst of feeling, every one of you that are here, you either have felt this or you will. Just live a little longer, trust me. Where you felt forsaken. You felt forsaken by people that you were close to at one time. And in in the midst of that, how do you... How do you keep your song when you feel forsaken? But you see, a lot of times it's in that forsaken place that our song gets a fresh revelation of the singer. Sometimes it's in those difficult moments. I, I, I love just, uh, you know, go with me one more time. And let's, let's look at Jonah. Uh, Jonah is running from the purpose and call of God, and he gets on a boat with a bunch of other rebellious people. But in the midst of that, a storm comes up, and he tells them, you know, listen, guys, I got you into this. You know, I preached a message years ago called Throw Jonah Out the Boat, you know. 
Because sometimes you get in some relationships with some folks, you ain't done nothing wrong, you just let the wrong people in your, anyway, in your sphere, and you're going through a storm, and you ain't got nothing to do with it. You just let Jonah in your boat. All right? And there's sometimes in love, uh, you got to throw Jonah out the boat. You say, I love you, but I, you know, trusting you is a whole nother ball ballgame. I'm, I'm called to love you unconditionally. I'm not called to trust you unconditionally. Hmm? And so Jonah says, uh, throw me over the boat. In the midst of his rebellion and all of his running, the scripture tells us that a great fish swallows him. Now, now it doesn't tell us. I mean, you know, when we were little kids, you know, we were told it was Jonah and the whale. Okay, now, the truth is we don't know. Uh, you know, it could have been Megalodon. I don't know. You know, the big fish they're still trying to find maybe somewhere 30,000 feet below the sea. I don't know. You know, just... <laughs> but But let's just say, just for argument's sake, it was a whale. I, I personally believe it probably was because Jonah in his rebellion had lost his song. And God allows him to get inside of a fish that is known for singing. Matter of fact, whales communicate by song. When they put those microphones, you watch Animal Planet, they put the microphones down in. It is the whales that are con- they're communicating by singing back and forth. You see, sometimes it's not until we're forsaken. It's not until we feel like nobody is around and everybody has gone crazy on us and everything has gone to pot. It is in those situations that we meet the singer in a whole new way. We get a whole fresh revelation of who he is. When everything is just going fine, we love him. But when all hell is breaking, breaking loose around us, and all of a sudden we got to forgive people. Hallelujah. All of a sudden we got to walk in love with people. All of a sudden we've got to make up our mind to live like Jesus in the midst of it. We get a fresh revelation of the singer, and in the midst of it, it's in the midst of the forsakenness that he releases out of us a new song. I'm convinced that it was because Jesus said this. He said, the Son of Man, he said, if you want to understand what this all looks like, the Son of Man is going to be just like Jonah in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Just like Jesus went into the belly of the earth, it was at that time that Jonah was in in the midst of the fish and I'm convinced when his song got restored is when the fish couldn't hold him in anymore death couldn't hold him down come on the grave couldn't keep him in and it was the song restored <laughs> that began to cause begin to cause the release see it's 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 in the midst of going through those times that we really find out where our walk is. Uh, in, in, anybody, anybody can shout after a miracle. Now, anybody can shout after provision. After something's happened. But in the midst of being in the belly, in the, I mean, the slime, the nasty, in the natural, the nasty, but yet we go through the slimy emotional stuff. We go through the slimy mental stuff. We live as humans and we're constantly experiencing in some form or another rejection. We get lied about. We get forsaken. People leave us. They walk away. We're misunderstood. But it's amidst of those seasons that a greater depth of his life begins to flow out of us. Because when we can sing then, Jesus hanging on the cross, in the midst of his pain, begins to worship. He wasn't just saying stuff. He was being our example, showing us that there is a song of deliverance. There is a... No wonder David... David could say, sing unto the Lord a new song. Let the children of Zion shout aloud on their beds. In other words, it it is when you get in those situations where you stop striving and you're learning to rest in the midst of even the pain that he gives you a new song to be able to sing. And we don't always we don't always understand the whys and When we're young, we get frustrated because we want all the answers. When I was younger, I didn't believe there was any such thing as a mystery. 
I get around young preachers and they'll still say that, ah, there ain't no mystery. God showed us everything. I'm like, yeah, just talk to me in 15 years. Because <laughs> if there's no mystery, if we got it all figured out, then there's no need for God. I, I, older I get, I'm, I'm embracing that mystery's okay. I don't, I don't have to know everything. I don't have to have it all figured out. I had it all figured out in my 20s and 30s. I, I had formulas for everything, man. I, I had it all down pat. There was answers for everything. And then, and then you get in situations and the answer don't work and the formula don't play out. And, and then you start going through some hell and some forsakenness and some misunderstandings and friends who are always close to you turn their back on you. People walk away from you for stupid reasons. And in the midst of that, you're like, God, I'm not even doing anything wrong. But it's in the midst of that forsakenness that we then experience the song that destroyed death and hell. Uh, if, if I were a title person, I'm horrible with titles. I just don't sit around and think about them enough, to be honest with you. I know. But if I were to entitle this, it would be the song that just defeated death and hell. Uh, it was it was a worship. It was a song that did it. And it was the Father in the Son singing. And so when we get in those difficult situations, guess what? That same Father and that same Son lives in us. And no matter what you go through in life, don't let life steal your song. Don't, don't let circumstances take that joy that is only found many times in those situations. There's, there's things I've experienced in my life that I would have loved to experience differently. I didn't like when I was going through it. I'm going to tell you right now, when I was going through it, it sucked. I don't even know how to be more plain than that. It was, I hated it. I didn't like it. But now 10 years later, 20 years later, I look back and I'm like, man, that, that produced something. You know, you know, when Jesus said, I am the way, do you know that the word, the word there for way in the Greek means I am the journey. I am the path. But when he said, I'm, I'm the way, he, He's not just saying, just look at me for this thing. In other words, you come to me and I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm, I'm going to take you down a path and, and I'm going to reveal myself to you. Sometimes here a little, there a little. Sometimes line upon line, precept upon precept, forsakenness to forsakenness, frustration to frustration. I ain't causing y'all to lose your song, am I? It's just, it's when we go through those things that we can worship. It's when we go through those things that worship becomes more, it becomes more than just, I mean, man, when I was younger, if, if, if I didn't, if I didn't dance for a half hour, I couldn't preach. I used to get up and tell people, if you ain't sweating, you ain't in the river. <laughs> if we're going to dance in the river. That means you better be sweating because if you ain't sweating, you didn't get in the river yet. Serious as a heart attack. Absolutely believed it too. <laughs> and, and right in the midst of that, it's like, I look back now and I'm like, first of all, I ain't even got the energy to do all that jumping around no more. Hallelujah. <laughs> just, I'm a grandpa now, Lord have mercy. I'm do my best to just get on my toes every once in a while. Just leave me alone. <laughs> but sometimes it's going through all of that stuff, it, it produces this journey and this path through you. And, and you learn how to sing, not just verbiage, but you begin to sing from something in the depths of your soul. That, that you just learn to throw up holy hands without doubt and without wrath and say, God, I, I don't know what to do in this situation. Like Jehoshaphat, I'm surrounded by the enemy, but my eyes are on you. I don't know what to do, but I'm just going to lift my hands and I'm going to trust that you're still here. You've not left me. You've not abandoned me. 
You've not thrown me away. No matter how much I feel alone, you're still there with me because you never leave me. You never abandon me. You never forsake me. See, I'm, I'm convinced, and someone come play if you would. I'm absolutely convinced that until we in our soul, not just in our spirit, but when it gets into our thinking where we become convinced that he will never abandon us, that he'll never throw us away, it is at that moment that we can become secure sons. That's why all creation's groaning for mature sons, sons that, that know how to sing when they feel forsaken. Creation isn't groaning for little children. It's groaning, it's groaning for those that have, have, have been through a path. They've chosen to walk down a journey and say, God, you know what? Uh, I, I got hurt in church and I had some crazy Christians that went crazy on me. And I went into business with a Christian and I'll never do that again. I met this person, I met that person. All, all of those things, and we've all experienced it in different ways. But it's in the midst of that. That we learn something that's so much deeper than just getting my praise on on a Sunday. It's in the midst of that where there's a wealth of strength and there's a wealth of peace that begins to rise up in us. So stand on your feet, would you? Father, I thank you tonight. Uh, thank you for your absolute amazing love for us. That your heart is always for us. It's never been against us. You're always passionately pursuing us. never abandon us. You'll never throw us away. We never have to be afraid of you saying away from me, I never knew you. Because we know that you not only know us, but you know us by name and we are as you were on this earth. And you said you wouldn't forsake yourself. So, Father, I thank you that you didn't forsake Jesus. But you and Jesus took our forsakenness once and for all, nailed it to the tree, rose triumphant, and you inhabited the praises of your children. Teach us to sing in the midst of whatever we're going through. We'll thank you for that, Father. Come on, just lift your hands, would you? Uh, would you just begin to worship for a moment? We don't, we don't have to sing anything specific. Just, I, I don't know what everybody here has been going through. I don't know uh, individually uh, things that you've experienced. Maybe some of you have, have experienced loss in the last few months. Maybe you've, uh, maybe you've experienced, uh, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've lost some finances. You've lost friends. You've lost family. There's... There's a path that you've been on and you've maybe not even understood what's going on, but in the midst of it, in the midst of it, God's love is never turned away from you, but always been turning towards you. And he's been passionately pursuing you and loving on you. So Father, we just bless you tonight. We bless you tonight. We, we honor you for your goodness. We honor you. Lord, I ask that you would restore if any of us have even a little bit lost our song. I ask that you restore the song. Lord, I ask that you release a, a new song, a song of deliverance, a song of life. As we learn how to cry aloud on our beds, as we learn to stay in a place of rest so that your life can flow, as we learn how to love those that are forsaking us and being ugly to us, just continue to release that song through us. We magnify you. We magnify you. We bless you tonight. We bless you tonight.
We bless you tonight.